in a world where convenience and technology rule. We evolved an exquisite set of genes to interact with our environment and suddenly we radically changed the environment. Our health is at stake. We don't walk as much, we don't eat as many fruits and vegetables. It's clear that exercise is critical to human health. The phrase, use it or lose it, couldn't be more true. Something is missing, but there is a solution. The cutting edge of nutritional science right now is in the whole concept of functional components of foods, like the phytonutrients. We'll explore where we've been and where we're headed. We'll be able to take a few drops of blood from that baby, enough to give us all the DNA we need to profile that baby's genetic background and eventually personalize his or her nutrition to maximize his or her health. Hear from leading experts in the field. The Chinese through millennium have looked at the person, the body, mind, spirit as a system, as a forest. Travel to remote regions of the planet that may still hold nutritional secrets. Explore the benefits of organic farming. From the beginning of time, men existed on organic farming. Understand the benefits of nutritional supplementation. Researchers at Harvard University are recognizing that most Americans would benefit from a multivitamin. In the next hour, we will trace the evolution of nutrition from the work of pioneers like Hippocrates to the high-tech study of the human genome. And we'll see how Earth and humans have interacted in a symbiotic dance during our quest for nutrition. Earth, a living, thriving organism. From its soil sprouts a vast garden of nutrients designed to support the body with the necessities for life. There's a great unity among living things. Plants are uniquely able to take dirt and sunshine, basically, and create nutrients. Nutrients that the plant needs to survive but also humans and animals need to survive so that when humans and animals eat these plants, they get these nutrients, these essential nutrients that they cannot make for themselves. In the Australian outback, aboriginals have thrived off of nature's bounty for over 40,000 years. Using the process of trial and error, they have figured out the best sources of nutrition for healthy living. It's a supermarket. This is our supermarket. This here is just normal woodland. But this, for a lot of our people, we actually refer to it as sugar bag country. So all around here you get all these different habitats and that we get our foods from all different areas. We know the seasons. There's about four seasons that comes every year. The seasons tells us, or the wind tells us what to get. And now the new generation is growing up and they're doing the same thing because the elder people are telling them what to do during the season. Throughout time and in all parts of the world, people have managed to thrive on whatever foods were available. Even though the foods available at different points in time and in different parts of the world are immensely diverse. This one here is bush grape. Normally what we do is we just pick it straight off the plant and eat it. A beautiful colour, isn't it? Our Aboriginal friends know very little about um, food science and food nutrition. However, over the course of uh, millennia, uh, they've worked out what materials of food they need to eat. When they began to domesticate and cook, they began to use roots. But up to that time, they used a lot of green leafy vegetables, huge amounts of green leafy vegetables. So they got a lot of antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals in their diet. They got very good protein from the meat and fish. Sadly, a byproduct of the modern age is its effect on indigenous populations. As cultures assimilate into modern society, eating habits have become more westernized. Today in Australia, Aborigines live in cities where they fall prey to the lure of nutritionally deficient foods. For many, the result has been debilitating. I went up to the doctor and told, can you check my blood, sugar blood? And one of the nurses checked me up and told me that I, I had diabetes. 
So the food industry has become too efficient really at doing this to our detriment nutritionally. And unfortunately it looks as if the Aboriginal people have also, with the advent of Western man into their society, they've taken up these trends too. And their nutrition is now suffering as a result. And that's unfortunate. Today, science is just beginning to understand how to maximize what the Earth has given us. But it has been a long road of hits and misses for the pioneers in food science. One that started thousands of years ago when the quest for nutrition came out of the forest and into the hands of science. Before traditional science, both Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine worked on the premise that food was essential to well-being. The Chinese concept of health is uh, having enough reserve to maintain flow and balance in our environment. Nutrition is a big part of it, to eat appropriately the right kind of foods. I think only about the time uh, of the uh, rise of the Greek civilization, about 2,500 years ago, as man began to first acquire the tools that today we call science, did people start to think formally about the way their bodies interacted with the earth. And food was very important. One of the first scientists to make the connection between health and nutrition was Hippocrates, the man we now call the father of modern medicine. In the fourth century BC, Hippocrates went against the traditional thinking that the cause of disease was a curse from a higher power. He was one of the first to understand and articulate the fact that what you eat, what goes into your body, has a very dramatic effect on your health. And that when your health begins to fail, food is one of the first places to look for reinforcement. Hippocrates, one of the great early physicians, always advised his students, think first about how you can treat your patient with food rather than with medicine. The appeal to what the earth provided naturally was the cornerstone of early medicine. For the next 24 centuries, the search for a tangible connection between food and health became one of the great challenges facing Western science. During the mid-1700s, as Western Europe continued to send their great ships around the globe on a quest of discovery, a landmark breakthrough was made that changed the course of nutrition. It was not only what went into the body, rather, what did not. The first great laboratory for studying human nutrition were the great sailing ships that went on voyages for a year or more around the world, representing the British Navy, perhaps, or the Portuguese Navy, because it was there that those sailors were deprived of most things that the Earth had to offer. At sea for months at a time, sailors would quickly consume their ration of fruits and vegetables. They had precious little in the way of variety to eat. They ate hardtack, which is kind of like biscuits uh, made out of refined flour. They started out with some whole foods as supplements to that. But by the time they'd been out for a few months, they ran out of all that stuff. What often resulted was widespread disease. One of the most common afflictions was scurvy, a painful disease that claimed thousands of lives. What you get from scurvy is you bleed. Your teeth fall out, your gums bleed, your tissues bleed. Physicians on the ships and in the ports of call studied the diseased men. One of these doctors was a Scottish physician named James Lind. Dr. Lind saw a link between the lack of fresh food and scurvy. He instructed the sailors to eat certain fruits. Men who had two oranges and one lemon a day had a complete remission of the bleeding gums and the loss of hair and other things that were going with the disease that today we call scurvy, which 200 years later we figured out was vitamin C deficiency. Limes were also used to treat scurvy. Because of Dr. Lin's work, British Parliament ordered its sailors to drink lime juice daily, and ever since, the British have been referred to as limeys. Soon, scientists began to look at other elements in the food chain. In 1840, German physician Dr. Justice Liebig theorized that plants were pulling nutrients from the air and the soil. Justice Liebig was probably the real first pioneer in understanding that there were things that we couldn't see, there were 
things that we hadn't yet described that had to be in the soil, that the plants must be drawing up out of the soil, that the animals must be eating, and either humans, either through directly eating the plants or eating animals, were bringing essentially invisible, unknowing things into our body. Dutch physician and future Nobel Prize winner Christian Eichmann took the early nutritional discoveries to the next level. Working on the island of Java in 1893, Eichmann studied the nerve-related disease beriberi, which plagued the islanders. Eichmann examined the islanders' diet, which consisted mainly of brown rice. What he discovered was when the islanders processed the rice from its natural state, they became ill. There came a time during civilization and processing of foods when they learned to polish off the brown matter coating of the rice and white rice became very popular. Unfortunately, it turned out that the white rice with the polishing had actually removed many of the B vitamins which occurred in the outer coating. Eichmann believed white rice contained poison and that brown rice had the antidote. As with so many previous nutritional questions, Eichmann had stumbled on the answer. And it was Eichmann's brilliance to see that if you restored brown rice to their diet, the symptoms went away. It was a disease of absence. There was, we were missing something. Brown rice had something that white rice didn't. Like those before him, Eichmann had proved that a simple nutritional fix could prevent a terrible disease. But scientists and physicians were still working in a hit and miss environment unaware of exactly what was in food that could make such a difference in a person's health. That was until 1911, when Polish scientist Kazimir Funk put a name on what we now take for granted. The term vitamin did not exist until about 1912, although many functional effects of nutrients were recognized hundreds or even thousands of years earlier. What wasn't there yet, the piece of the puzzle that wasn't there yet, was what today we would call biochemistry we began to find, if you will, a molecular explanation for why things go wrong in a vitamin deficiency disease. By the 20th century, the connection between health and food had been widely accepted. Soon, diet was being recognized as important to health and a potential aid against certain diseases. It was the beginning of a new era in nutritional science. In the early to mid-1900s, scientific understanding regarding the needs of the human body rested upon a solid base. The basic nutrients for human survival, carbohydrates, protein, fats, and water, were called macronutrients. But a new set of food components was about to be discovered. The period from about 19... 10 through about 1947 was the period of vitamin discovery and most of that was in the first 20 years in the 20s and 30s because there were new scientific techniques that allowed them to identify components of foods that turned out to be essential nutrients. Elmer Vernon McCollum and his colleagues at the University of Wisconsin were working to determine what types of food could help in the growth of farm animals. During their experiments, they fed milk to cows. From these experiments, McCollum and his team discovered an essential nutrient. They called it vitamin A. They identified as vitamin A, and so because it was the first vitamin, it was called vitamin A. Expanding on their discovery, they continued to work with the animals. The flood of vitamin identification had begun. They discovered there was some other essential component in the water part of milk. Vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin, so it's in the fat part of milk that you skim off of the milk. But there are other essential nutrients that were in the water-soluble portion, and these were called vitamin B. And in the beginning, it was thought that there was just one vitamin B. Eventually, it was learned that there were many vitamin Bs, B1, B2, B6, etc. As the discovery of vitamins snowballed, nutritionists began to look deeper into the beneficial components of food. The history of nutrition and how humans understand the role of nutrition in health is a history of pioneers who go beyond the edge of what uh, traditional medicine is thinking about. Uh, that's as true in the 20th century as it was in the 17th century. In the early 20th century, a man named Carl Renberg was working in China. American entrepreneur Carl Renborg noticed that the rural Chinese population seemed healthier than those inside major cities. He realized that because city dwellers had few places to grow, they ate less vegetables. They also ate more polished rice. 
those in the rural areas lived off a more natural food supply. Through trial and error, he devised a solution, a homemade stew of available nutrients. Renborg was thinking, what do I need to do to maximize the nutritional value of the things we have? And he actually said, well, I've got to put in bone marrow from bones of animals, as many greens as I can get. We need iron. Where can I get iron? At one point, he was even thinking about rusty nails as a source of iron. But it's less important how palatable it was back in 1920 to the fact that he thought we've got to get what today we know as, as vitamins and minerals into this, this stew that he would eat. And he saw that people who ate what he prepared did better than those that didn't. Renborg's experience in China convinced him to further explore dietary supplementation. Renborg came back to the United States um, and embarked on what was really a lifelong journey to improve human nutrition. And he realized every step of the way that the earth had the answers. He was one of the first people to start pulling us back to what today we call organic farming. For most of human history, indigenous cultures lived in concert with the land. So if we're going out and we're collecting, say, yams and that, you break it off and you stick it back in the ground, we'll take some of the root and not all of it, or, you know, break it off, put it back in, grow it. Um, cover up holes when you're digging, even in, just in the bush. If you're digging up things, you cover it over. Hardly ever you'll see an Aboriginal person take from the ground and not cover that hole over. It's important that we do that so other things can grow. Nature has a fantastic system that balances itself out, it rejuvenates, it enhances itself over and over naturally. Any system that's natural takes plant material, drops it back into the earth, recycles it and reuses nutrients. Microbial populations in the soil are constantly releasing nutrients. They're broken down by this microbial population and released to a plant. Carl Renborg knew that plants extracted both the good and the bad from the soil. So instead of using pesticides to control insects, he used more natural organic methods. One of the methods that we can use in organic farming to control insect problems is the use of beneficial insects. So these ladybugs, they're going to go out here and they're going to look for food, basically. The food that they like is an aphid. The aphid is detrimental for us. So these guys, as we broadcast them out into the fields, they're going to go all through this field, colonize it, reproduce again, build up population. They're going to go in all through these plants looking for the insects that we don't want. That's their food, and that's what's going to support them. Renborg and others began to experiment with various organically grown plant foods. He concentrated much of his effort on alfalfa. After harvest, Renborg dried the plants and studied their nutritional composition. What he found was an entirely new set of compounds. He called them associated food factors. My father told the scientists and medical community that there were these important factors in plant materials. Uh, they pretty much laughed at him and said, well, there might be some factors, but they're not important in nutrition. They have no, no, no real value. They're maybe important to the plant, but certainly not to the human. Renberg was a synthesizer. He took what we knew about deficiency disorders. He took what we needed to know about farming and, and built upon it and started tying the fabric together, weaving the fabric of what today is modern, healthy nutrition. For the next 20 years, Renborg continued his experiments, removing the water and fiber from various plants and putting the dried material into tablets along with the known vitamins and minerals, Renborg developed North America's first plant-based multivitamin, multimineral food supplement. His belief was to put all these things together into one product. It wasn't just a magic nutrient, it wasn't a magic mineral. It was the combination of all these things combined in, in a proper way. Independent of Renborg, Dr. Roger Williams was also studying human nutrition. Williams suggested that many unidentified compounds were also important for nutrition. He proposed the term neutralite for these vitamin-like substances, which in small amounts helped in the nutrition of organisms. It would be years, however, until the world embraced Williams and Renborg's theories. In the 1960s, the diets of seven diverse countries were examined for their effect on human health. From the study, a clear winner emerged as the best diet from the group. I found out that in the seven countries study, the people who had the lowest rate of heart disease lived the longest and had the lowest rate of cancer. 
were the people in the island of Crete. So I decided to look at the traditional diet of Greece. Living off the land and sea, the Greeks had been eating the same foods for nearly 4,000 years. So it occurred to me that maybe their diet must have been similar to the diet that we evolved in. Because I knew, for example, that they ate a lot of wild plants. Dr. Artemis Simopoulos took the results of the seven countries' study and combined it with her own work on another food component, essential fatty acids. You can think of them as messengers that give the proper advice to the cell to carry out normal metabolism. There are two families of essential fatty acids, and they're called essential because the body cannot make them. So we have to get them from our diet. And the two families are the omega-6 and the omega-3. And they get their names from their chemical structure. During evolution, these two essential fatty acids are, were balanced. In today's typical Western diet, omega-6s are found in vegetable oils made from corn, sunflower, and cottonseed. Omega-3s are most abundant in cold water fish. The key to good health is a balanced ratio. Greece, of course, has one of the best ratios, is about two. The Japanese, because they eat a lot of fish, they have one of the best ratios, four to one. The Japanese have another distinction that sets them apart. On the island of Okinawa, there are more centenarians per capita than any culture on Earth. On average, Okinawans eat seven servings of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains per day and three servings of cold water fish per week. To wash it all down, they drink six cups of green tea per day. The result is a people with healthier arteries with one of the lowest rates of cancer in the world. By the late 1970s, nutritional science had become an accepted practice worldwide. In the United States, the government published several reports praising the benefits of a plant-based diet. A report called Diet and the Killer Diseases that was published in 1976 demonstrated that improvements in dietary habits could actually reduce the risk of cancer, heart disease, osteoporosis, and other killer diseases. The estimate has been made that about 35% of chronic diseases are due to dietary habits and to other lifestyle habits, including smoking, not getting an adequate amount of physical exercise, or eating a poor diet. The pioneers of nutrition had been scientifically accepted. But the quest for nutritional knowledge continued. In 2004, we continue to pull our nourishment from the Earth's soil. And as we continue on our quest for nutrition, science has determined that the simplicity of nature still offers the most complete nutrition for optimal health. One of the really interesting things about nutrition is that all kinds of populations all over the world manage to get adequate nutrition, although they have hugely varied diets. The society living in primitive conditions where all of the foods they eat are whole foods, it works out. These foods have nutrients in them that protect the plants and that help the plants grow. If they're animals, they have nutrients in them that help the animals grow. And then when the people eat them, they get that same benefit. So it all worked in kind of a natural interaction for thousands of years before anybody knew about nutrition. Nutritional science has yielded critical clues in the understanding of how natural foods maintain our health. The basis for this understanding is that vitamins are a cornerstone for nutrition. Vitamins have a real range of, of functions within the body. Where without it, you can't make the body work properly. It's a bit like trying to drive a car without wheels. It just won't go anywhere. And that, that's the way that vitamins work. They, they help the biochemical processes in the body uh, to make it all happen. Vitamins are things, by definition, with a couple of exceptions, that we cannot make ourselves. They go into our stomach, where the food is broken down by stomach acids, into our intestine, where in a more refined process, the food is further divided up and broken down into smaller components, absorbed across the intestinal wall into the bloodstream where special proteins carry individual vitamins and minerals ultimately to the cells. At the turn into the 21st century, technology is the driving force behind modern society. Machines drive our economy, 
Computers keep us connected, and automobiles move us from place to place. But there is a flip side to progress that has had a profound effect on our health. Today, we are very sedentary. We don't walk as much. We don't work with uh, our bodies. We use all kinds of mechanical devices, and then we use the automobiles. Pollution is new in the history of human evolution. For all practical purposes, pollution to reach any level that would concern our health is probably just a few hundred years old. It's got to put tremendous pressure on us. Modern environmental hazards like pollution, pesticides, and stress attack our every tissue, pitting our bodies in a battle against a recently discovered enemy called free radicals. We live in an environment of oxygen. We need oxygen, we have to have it, but also on a chemical basis, it, um, it can be damaging to some of the components of your cells and even to your DNA. Some of this is just natural oxygen that occurs in the environment and when it's broken down, it sometimes creates a damaging species called free radicals that can actually attack other molecules in your body and cause them to malfunction. Free radicals are really, um, if you observe a group of children and you find that some might be um, generally active, some might be a little bit sluggish, but some again might be hyperactive and charge around the place and do furious things and very difficult for their parents to handle. To neutralize the effects of free radicals, scientists have once again turned to plants and they've uncovered a wide array of compounds that may help. These beneficial compounds are called antioxidants, powerful agents that attack free radicals on the cellular level. We need to slow them down and uh, quench them a bit and that's what the antioxidants do. They help to quench and slow down these radicals so that they don't have some harmful effects. Antioxidants such as those found in vitamin C and vitamin E cannot be manufactured in the body. Instead they must be obtained from the diet through certain plants. Citrus fruits, red peppers, and broccoli are loaded with antioxidants. Exotic fruits like the acerola cherry and the kakadu plum have some of the highest levels of vitamin C. And vitamin E rich foods like peanuts, almonds, and seeds are powerful allies in the fight against free radicals. These and hundreds of other plant foods are now at the forefront of the fight against imbalance in the body's defense system caused by the effects of modern life. So what we want to do is we want to have a diet that is rich in antioxidants that will more or less guard against the effects of pollution and the formation of oxygen radicals which actually increase the aging process as well as um, increase inflammation in the body. They require a lot more antioxidants to quell inflammation. While antioxidants fight free radicals that have taken hold in the body, another group of associated food factors is being examined for its potential use in nutrition. In the last 10 years or more, um, there has also been an increased interest on, in other components of food. Called phytochemicals or phytonutrients, these compounds play a protective role in keeping the plant healthy. The hope is that they can do the same for humans. When you consume them, these phytonutrients also provide antioxidant protection for your body and for the components of your body that are under continuous attack by oxidating agents uh, and that need protection in order to maintain their integrity. Initial testing has been positive. For example, lutein from spinach and lycopene from tomatoes are believed to reduce the risk of certain cancers. And catechins found in green tea are known to support heart health. Although research is in its initial stages, scientists around the world have identified thousands of phytochemicals in all kinds of plants. The future of phytochemicals uh, is the future of nutrition because we know pretty much now what the macronutrients do and what the vitamins do. Uh, what we don't know is the potential of phytochemicals, but there's enough information out there now to suggest that they have a fairly vital role in the prevention of uh, dis certain diseases. Today, leading health organizations around the world recommend people eat at least five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. And the American Institute on Cancer Research states there is a strong and consistent pattern showing that diets high in fruits and vegetables decrease the risk of many cancers. 
In today's era of fast food and quick fixes, getting the necessary nutrients for good health can be a real challenge. From quickly prepared processed foods to fruits and vegetables grown in nutrient depleted soils, making the right choices can be baffling to even the most health conscious. Every day you're bombarded with either the right signals or the wrong signals. And that uh, already show in our kids, we're seeing type 2 diabetes in young people. And I would say nutrition is a major, major part of it. But as people are becoming more sophisticated about their diets and the need for exercise, nutritionists are looking to new ways to satisfy our appetites for healthy food products. The result has been the blossoming of an entire industry dedicated to supplementing the diet with vital nutrients. In today's world, we obviously have a wide variety of foods available to us. Natural foods, fruits, vegetables, animal products. And those can be combined into a very nutritious diet, a diet that will support our health. But in addition, we now have more information. We now understand which nutrients are essential. We're able to extract those from the food sources and concentrate them in small amounts in tablets, capsules, which are conveniently available to people to ensure that they get optimum nutrition. Supplements guarantee that you'll have more than adequate amounts of everything that we know is important today if you take a full range of supplements. Over 2,000 years of nutritional science is being pulverized, mixed, pressed into tablets, and shipped to the far corners of the globe. Today, the distribution of vitamins and mineral supplements is more than a $60 billion a year mega industry. It is believed that people who improve their diet or who, t or who in some cases take an appropriate supplement of very specific nutrients can help reduce their risk of heart disease, reduce their risk of cancer, reduce their risk of osteoporosis, and in other ways, improve their health outlook. Nutritional supplements vary in their composition. Synthetic supplements isolate specific vitamins, while natural supplements made from concentrates or extracts contain vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. Both types of supplements come in tablets and capsules, but the industry is working on a variety of new delivery systems. Certain people uh, are not too keen on uh, plant foods, fed fruits and vegetables and some people just prefer to take these vitamins in the form of a supplement. Maybe an apple a day does help keep the doctor away, but more importantly, that's a symbol for the value of eating healthy and having healthy nutritional supplements. After all, many nutritional supplements just take what's in good fruits and vegetables and concentrates them for you. While most everyone can gain from either type of supplement, certain people can benefit more than others. If you're not going to eat fish three, four times a week, then you really need to take the supplement. There is no difference in terms of the effects of omega-3 fatty acids, where you take it in the form of a supplement or you take it by eating fish. Supplements can also aid those trying to lose weight. Calorie-controlled diets can make it difficult to get all the necessary nutrients. By taking supplements, dieters are assured to receive proper vitamin and mineral levels in the body. Now, if you eat too much food, you just absorb too many calories with it and you become overweight. And perhaps this is a role where um, supplements and herbals can play a part, where you have extracts of the important components of the food without the uh, heavy calories and uh, the excessive weight. Another group of people who can benefit from supplements is the elderly. Supplements ensure that the elderly, who are more prone to nutritional deficits, get the nutrients their bodies need. And a group of researchers at Tufts University who specialize in researching the needs of the elderly about two years ago published a pyramid, a suggested pyramid for the elderly. And this pyramid also makes certain changes in the content of the pyramid, but then adds to the top of it a little flag. And the flag is to remember to take their supplements. Nutrition bars have also found a niche in our fast-moving societies. This multi-billion dollar a year industry has made it palatable for those on the run to get their necessary nutrients. But as with all types of supplements, they should be viewed as a complement to a healthy diet.
It should always be recognized that as good as supplements may be as an insurance policy or in optimizing nutrient intake, they never substitute for a good diet or for a healthy lifestyle. They are always complementary to a good diet and a healthy lifestyle. Another advantage to supplements is their mobility. The kakadu plum, a staple of the Aboriginal diet in Australia, is a great example of how regional nutrition is becoming available to a wider audience. The kakadu plum, it occurs only in the northern part of Australia. So we have to find a form to preserve uh, that fruit and the vitamin C it contains. And the best way to really do that is in a supplement form. With the use of supplements growing every day, the industry is faced with the challenge of offering a wide range of supplements available to the public. During our quest for nutrition, technology has been both a help and a hindrance. On one hand, it has enabled scientists to understand the components of food and their effect on the body. But it has also been responsible for many of the obstacles in our path toward good health. Ironically, today scientists are working to bring us back to nature with modern scientific techniques. Scientists David Brome and Don Pusateri are traveling to a kakadu plum test site in the Australian outback. Uh, there's some roots up there. It's our natural grazers out there. <laughs> in a carved out swath of land, the men have set up an organic farm that is home to thousands of kakadu plum trees in various stages of development. For over five years they have tended the trees in hope that they will produce enough fruit to supply consumers with the benefits of the plum. The goal is for these phytonutrient packed plums to be turned into nutritional supplements. This is a fascinating point where foods that haven't yet been developed um, are suddenly being being looked at from a Western perspective and seeing what the value is in them. To me, it's the marriage of primitive foods that haven't been adulterated by Western hybridization of, of products, nor has it been diluted by the use of synthetic or artificial chemicals. So you've got the raw product that's been used for thousands and thousands of years, and here it is, we've got in an orchard. The kakadu plum was originally known, probably most notably by the uh, indigenous people, as being a, a fruit with um, characters which are very beneficial to health. Um, that was later learned to be high vitamin C content. It's got a whole range of other little things in there that they're still exploring to, to find out what the magic is, why it is that old Aboriginal people take this stuff into the hospitals to give to the people who are sick in hospitals, you know? There's got to be something in there. So this plant is commonly known as Billy Goat Plum. Nowadays people are referring to it as Kakadu Plum. In the dry season we'll actually come out, bring the kids out, come out for a day of harvesting and collect pretty much just straight off the ground or shake the tree. The scientists are working with the native population to identify trees in the wild that are healthy and when transferred to the farm will not affect the ecology of the area. What we're looking to do is actually uh, bring this tree into cultivation, something that's never been done before. So we're trying to determine what best uh, varieties to have in the ground, the best way of growing it. We're able to develop trees that can grow well and be harvested. We'll gather the fruit. The fruit is immediately frozen and transported to a processing facility where it is extracted, turn it into a concentrate. To produce enough plant material for the marketplace, millions of plums will have to be grown and harvested. Unfortunately, nature and traditional farming methods are not prepared to produce such numbers. But scientists on the other side of the country, in Sydney, have figured out a way to clone the plants in the laboratory. The idea for cloning is to reproduce exactly the same elite material that has been selected in the wild with these plants. A shoot is taken from the plant in the wild and uh, grown on in the nursery it is then introduced to the tissue culture process and multiplied from which many shoots are created and sent back to the plantation uh, from which ultimately thousands of trees can be grown and the fruit harvested. But what we're looking to do is not really enhance what, what nature provides but giving nature the opportunity to grow more of the elite plants that are within that local kakadu plum population. Once the plum trees have taken root in the laboratory they are then shipped back to the farm where they are replanted. We've gone the full circle. This is great. 
This is where uh, science, I guess, intersects with the outback. It does. It's almost leapfrogging. You're going from nature to science, and now you're back to nature once again, only in multiple. And in a few years, ideally, we'll be producing fruit off of these tissue culture plants, and uh, it'll be high, very high vitamin C fruit that we're producing. Oh, yeah. We'll hope to share this one with the world. Sharing the benefits of indigenous plant-based foods and herbs is also the goal of several teams working across the globe. In Siberia, Rhodiola rosea has been used for centuries as an energy elixir and appetite suppressant. In the Republic of the Congo grows Aframomum stipulatum. This herb in the ginger family has been used for centuries to promote male fertility. Mushrooms are being studied in China for their beneficial effects on the immune system. Commercial operations are growing algae ponds across the world to harvest important carotenoids like beta-carotene. And there are thousands of other plants still to be discovered that will eventually benefit us all. We only eat probably less than 0.1% of the total plants that occur in, uh, in the, uh, the global sphere. So there's a huge area that we've yet to cover. While science continues to search the globe for new plant materials, the future of nutritional science is becoming personal. As Chinese doctors have known for centuries, every human being should be treated as having a unique physical makeup that requires individual attention. Every human being is different. And while we don't understand yet how, one can be pretty sure that everybody's nutritional needs are a little bit different depending on the genes they're born with, the environment they grow up with, uh, the diet that they consume every day. In fact, you can go all the way back to two and a half thousand years ago at the time of Hippocrates, who said that positive health depends on humans' constitution, what today we call genetics. Aiding the theory of individual nutrition is the study of the human genome. Nutritionists now have a powerful tool designed to take us into yet another era of nutritional science. One of the great developments that's come out of the Human Genome Project, the understanding of what all our genes are and how they're, how they're organized and things like that, has been we are beginning to understand human differences at the genetic level. Nutrition is going to do the same thing. We're going to understand that depending on your genetic background, certain supplements or combinations of vitamins and trace minerals are better for your health than they might be for somebody else's. We're going to personalize nutrition. In Chinese medicine, every individual has his own constitution, and you match it with the right kind of uh, food, exercise, and medicine. A big part of it is determined by you know, genetics. We now understand that the food you eat regulates your gene expression. This is going to have a huge impact on the future of nutrition. And with personalized diet, nutritional supplementation, and lifestyle changes, we may be able to forestall or even avoid many chronic diseases. In the future, it's very possible, and it'll be some time from now, that we'll be able to take a few drops of blood from that baby, enough to give us all the DNA we need, that's what genes are made of, to study, to profile, if you will, that baby's genetic background, and eventually to personalize his or her nutrition to maximize his or her health. Today, we are all in this together. The quest for nutrition and optimal health continues as it has for centuries. With the evolution of science, we now realize many of the answers have always been there, growing around us in the simplicity of nature. We came into this planet that produced a perfect food supply for us. And I think it's our responsibility to return whatever we have eliminated back into the food supply that was there before. What is a broad prescription to maximize humans, human health in the 21st century? Uh, eat right, get an adequate supply of calories and nutrition, make sure you have the supplementation you need in your diet, exercise vigorously every day, even if it's only for a few minutes, minimize stress. I think we live in a world that cultivates stress. and. Take some lessons from our great teachers in both the East and West about uh, seeing yourself as part of a human family. 
to minimize stress. There's nothing better than to go out into the garden and to collect something, uh, especially if you've grown it yourself, because a freshly picked tomato or beans or whatever uh, will be the most nutritious form of the food you are able to get. And this perhaps gets back to the old hunter-gatherer instinct in all of us. Uh, where we're getting back to our basics and uh, the earth is there, it's supplying us with food just as our forebears did perhaps uh, tens of thousands of years ago. We've obviously come a long way since Hippocrates and we have learned more about what nutrients are essential and how to provide them most efficiently and effectively to people who want to improve or optimize their diet. Many, many health professionals now believe that that the best way to improve health is to improve diet, just as Hippocrates believed uh, 2,000 years ago. And with tools like the human genome, we can now expand on nature, while symbolically returning to the forest, where plants have nourished our bodies since the beginning of time.纽崔莱健康机构欢庆人类营养研究过去曾经有个时期